Welcome to Ring of Fire. I'm Mike Papantonio. Here's what's coming up on today's show. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce, well, they found a new way, an absolutely new way to take advantage of military veterans. We'll explain that latest scam in just a moment. And even with the spotlight shining on police officers, violence against unarmed civilians continues to escalate. And we'll tell you why so little is actually being done about that problem. And be careful next time you grab a cheap bottle of wine from the grocery store, because chances are it's gonna be tainted with arsenic. We'll bring you the details of that emerging story. We have all that and more coming up, but right now, just remember, you just stepped into the ring of fire. You can't change Washington from the inside. You can only change it from the outside. Grand jury secrecy rules. For political gain. The press can find out. That has nothing to do with politics, but go ahead. It wouldn't bother me. Oops. <laughs> Republicans always tell us that they're the party of patriotism and the only party that really supports the troops. But they've been working for years to make it easier, much easier, for corporations to take advantage of our soldiers. And I have David Haynes with me now to explain how they're doing that. David, it looks like uh, the Republicans just won't give military veterans a break. They won't even give active military uh, soldiers a break. I, it's incredible to me the coverage that the Republicans are giving to the banking industry and the lending industry in making soldiers victims again. Tell us the story. Well, you're right. The Republican Party gives a lot of uh, lip service uh, to uh, you know, the military and the great sacrifices that they're making our military members. But when the rubber hits the road and there's a choice between Wall Street or our military members, it's clear that the Republicans are siding uh, on the side of Wall Street. And this is, we can see these examples, particularly when it comes to uh, the financial products and, and different loans that are being given to the military members. They should have certain protections, of course, particularly when they're deployed abroad. But Wall Street and the big banks are finding a way to get around this, particularly through forced arbitration clauses and other uh, co contractual language that probably these service members aren't able to read. Okay, okay, let me let me let me break it down just a little bit. First of all, there's there are two acts, uh, legislative acts that are in statutory acts that are in place now. One is the Military Lending Act, and the other one is the Service Member Civil Relief Act. Now, those are designed to say that if somebody is over in Afghanistan taking bullets for us. There, that uh, you know, some thuggish bank or lending agency can't come in and take their car and take their home and do certain things without them being able to address it when they're back in the United States. I mean, it's just common sense. The soldier leaves his his wife at home, the children at home. Many times, the wife is simply taking care of the children. She's un unable to work. Soldiers over there trying to make uh, a living and, and, and do his job as a soldier. And these, these Cretan banks, these thuggish criminal quality lenders are coming in and taking advantage of him or her while they're overseas. Tell us the story. Uh, tell us how bad it's gotten. You're right. The, the two acts that you mentioned uh, are designed to do a number of things. One is to cap the interest rate, for example, at 6% per year. That's one of the protections when service members are abroad, but the banks are getting around this uh, through these pre-dispute uh, pre arbitration clauses where they're saying, no, you can't take us to court. You don't have any other uh, uh, redress against us other than arbitration, which by the way, that's gonna be a, a panel that's on the other side of the country. We're gonna pick the arbitrators and we're gonna pay them. And you can't go to court around your local military installation. So essentially eliminating uh, their ability to dispute predatory practices. And so you have military uh, attorneys that are objecting to the lenders, the banksters, the thuggish Wall Street types that are trying to now take advantage of soldiers when they're, as you point out, they may be in North Carolina and the arbitration takes place in California. So how do they get there? They may be in Afghanistan and it's taken place in the U.S. How do they get there? Uh, so lawsuits are being brought. And the question is being asked, when is Congress, this Republican Congress, going to do anything about it? But Congress is going just the opposite way on this, aren't they? You know, incredibly, Republican members of the Congress are saying we, we don't see a problem unless we see empirical evidence that military members are being harmed by this. But the fact is, 
There have been a number of recent studies, including by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which says that there's tremendous harm that's resulting uh, from this to consumers as well as military members. But it, it's a choice between Wall Street and Main Street, and, and even worse than, than Main Street, our military members. And many of the Republicans in the majority is siding with Wall Street and the campaign donations that are flowing into Capitol Hill, regrettably. And this well, is a larger issue. I, I think this is really important. I mean, the real dunce Republicans, the real the real dunce, I mean, you know, not just the normal Republicans, the dunce Republicans, the ones that go beyond the norm, their argument is is the same argument they're using on any kind of science kind of concept. In other words, in, in global climate change, their argument is, oh, gee, the science isn't there. They're making the same argument here, aren't they, David? They're saying there's just no science. There's no empirical data to say that the guy in Afghanistan who's fighting for this country is somehow prejudiced when we send somebody to take his car here in the United States because he hasn't, he's not current on his payments. That there's, there's, there's just not enough information to say that, gee, this is really a problem. Yeah, it's just just denial, deny, deny, deny. You know, we're not aware of the problem when, when the facts are there. And uh, in addition to these recent studies, I mean, it's obvious to anyone that looks at this issue, as you say, the military members, uh, these are young families. Uh, it, it, they're, you know, the rent to own, the payday loans. A number of these financial institutions are, are basically setting up shop around our major military installations around this country uh, because they have regular pay. They, they can garnish their wages and so forth. So it's, it's, it's a terrible uh, situation where a lot of these uh, our good men and women are being taken advantage of while uh, Wall Street is, is profiting off of their backs and their sacrifice. It's very regrettable. They have payday loans set up all over military bases. They have the, the very bottom of the lender organization set up all around lender bases. They know that here you have a victim, potential victim, that you can get on the hook. And then once you get on the hook, here's what they know. Statistically, when somebody is involved in military, uh, active military duty like this, there's, they're going to they're gonna miss some payments. That just It's just the reality of it. And so they understand that here you've got a soldier that might have made 25 payments, doesn't make the 26 payment, and then they send somebody to get their car uh, I- immediately. I mean, it, so, so to me, what I'm, as I'm looking at this story, I'm, I'm first of all asking myself, why isn't the media talking about this? Because it is outrageous. And second of all, how can a Republican congressman with a straight face, look at a military, active military, and say, gee, I'm there for you when this kind of thing is going on. I mean, what, what, how, how do you get there? It's, it's tough. You shouldn't get there. The way, you know, the, their decision making appears to be driven by money and financial contributions, unfortunately. There's just no other, no other uh, explanation, and it's very sad. What's the success? What are the chances of a military uh, uh, type or anybody uh, actually succeeding in arbitration. How bad is arbitration for consumers in general, for everybody, not just military, but certainly for military? How bad is, is arbitration? It, the, the chances are virtually nil because none of the military members or individual consumers are even able to pursue it. So essentially what you're doing is you're just eliminating their right uh, to any redress or dispute. And so it's a larger issue outside just the military community for all consumers as well. It's also basically eliminating class action uh, cases as well, but it's just letting these banks and financial institutions run roughshod over the consumer and over the military. You, you uh, handle person. arbitration, and I guess you'd agree the statistics that I'm seeing is that most of the time the lending agency uh, succeeds 80% of the time, the consumer almost never, because the arbitrators actually work for the lending agency. They're on their payroll. It, this is an outrageous story. We need to talk about this some more because obviously. Uh, the, this is going to be the Congress, Republican congressmen are trying to slip this through quietly without military personnel knowing about it. David, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Pat. The death of Michael Brown and Ferguson brought police brutality to the national stage. But in the months since that shooting, there's been very little action to prevent another tragedy. In fact, we've only seen more deaths. Joining me now to talk about the growing problem is Howard Nations. Uh, you know, Howard, it's, it's so typical of the media, as the attention span of the media is uh, we look at it for several days. Some, Depending on the story, we might look at it a week, maybe two weeks, and then, the, then, then nobody pays any attention to the backstory after that. 
I think the Ferguson situation is a great example of that. Everything, uh, you know, everything from Mike Brown to everything that's happened there in Ferguson continues really nationally. And it's not just it's not just African Americans. It is it affects all of us where it comes to the way that police handle us in custody. Talk about what's happening nationally on this. Well, Mike, there is a principle in psychology called the availability principle. And it says that we take our actions and we make our decisions based upon the information that is available to us. That's where the media becomes so very important. So if we had more information about the shootings in custody, uh, the shootings during arrest by police officers of citizens, we might get some real action. Uh, this all started, to give you a little history, back in 2000 they had the Death in Custody Reporting Act that was passed and the idea was if they could gather information and make it available to the public, it may help us approach the problem. It would be available to them. Uh, but there were no teeth in the law. The states refused to go along with it. Uh, the police departments refused to go along with it. The NRA, of course, op opposed it because it involves guns. The right wing opposed it. The result was that it expired in 2006 with very little results. Uh, they tried four more times to renew it and were un unable to do so until recently. recently. Well, let, let me but, ask you this. Obviously, the importance of that is in most things that affect our society or culture, there's some kind of central reporting. Right. And the, your, your point is there certainly should be some kind of central reporting where police are killing citizens. I mean, are there, however they do it, whether they shoot them, what, right. what, what, whether they beat them to death, there should be some type of central reporting to where we can look back and say, how did we do that year? You know, did we do well exactly. or did we do worse? Is that your point? That's exactly right. For example, the shooting of police, police officers who are killed uh, in the line of duty, that, that database goes back to the 1700s and it is updated daily. But the DOG, DOJ stats from 2003 to 2009 show that there are 4,813 people who have died in custody or doing arrest. Uh, there's no data regard, regarding if they're armed or race or ethnicity or things of that nature. The good news is Representative Bobby Scott, from, a Democrat from Virginia, after the death of Michael Brown and Eric Garner, uh, he managed to get Congress to pass or the Senate to pass the Death in Custody Reporting Act, which says now states have to report to the DOJ the number of people killed during arrest and in custody, uh, and they also have the requirement for all federal law enforcement agencies. They have to report age, gender, race, ethnicity, the date, time, and location, and a brief description of the act. Now, this time, they put some teeth in it. The Attorney General has a $500 million fund to go to the states. He can withhold those funds if the states refuse to cooperate. In other words, what, when we, uh, by the way, this, the, a lot of the material we're talking about here is in a great article by Mother Jones, and I just think it's so well done. It's just such a well-done well article by Mother Jones magazine. But they talk about the idea that when we started, when the Department of Justice started focusing on Ferguson, all of a sudden it was almost like a eureka moment. They understood was. this is not just about Ferguson. They understood, first of all, that they didn't have any way to really do a, a, a really comprehensive report because there was no reported information. And the next thing they found out was the similarity between the way that Ferguson operates as far as it's how it trains its police, the, the attitude about police, about the citizens, not just African Americans, not just Hispanics, not, I mean, across the board. How, how do they regard citizens in general? But they started seeing a pattern that they, they thought had application to the rest of the nation, and it does. Um, out of Ferguson, I'm interested in your response to this, Howard. Uh, the, of course, you heard the right wing saying, yes, the reason that more African Americans uh, are, are targeted and the reason we have more deaths uh, by police uh, with African Americans is the right wing is out there saying, well, of course, they commit more crime. That really doesn't bear itself out on a per capita uh, analysis, does it? Not at all. As a matter of fact, the crime that Michael Brown was committing was uh, walk, was uh, jaywalking, 
and the crime that Eric Garner was, was committing was allegedly selling un, untaxed cigarettes. And the crime uh, but, that Wall Street is committing is they steal $13 trillion <laughs> from us and nobody goes to jail. But that puts it in perspective, doesn't it? But go exactly. ahead. Exactly. But you, you're, the, in the absence of DOJ adequate reporting, you've had uh, websites uh, come up that are based on media links where research has been done by independent groups around the country. This is amazing. They found in 2013 there were 763 people killed by police officers. In 2014, there are 1,100. This is not just African Americans. In 2014, there were 1,100 people killed by police officers. That's a 44% increase in one year. That's an average of three per day. So while violent crime in, a, in the United States is at an all-time low, police shootings are at an all-time high. And when you look at this, in 2014, 1,100 people shot by police. In 2014, in the military in Afghanistan and Iraq, there were only 58, thank God, only you 58 know, military killed. Mother Jones did a great job also pointing out, I think, that um, these shootings of unarmed uh, uh, black men, they're not limited to poor uh, black communities. I mean, we're seeing, uh, it, no matter where, if you're driving while black, if you're walking right. while black, you're at risk whether you're in Hollywood, Riverside, California, Prince George County, in, in uh, wherever. You're yep. at risk. And I thought that was a, a pretty compelling. In other words, if you think you're doing everything right and you're not going to be a victim in all this, I think this, this story really says, uh-uh, that's not the case. What's your take on it? Well, there was also a study of 10 major cities uh, regarding fatal police shootings. They found a very highly disproportionately high number of African Americans that were shot by police in all 10 cities, particularly New York, San Diego, and Las Vegas. But for example, in, in Oakland, officer-involved shootings, 37 out of 45 shootings, 82% were African American, zero were white. There were 15 fatalities. So this, this whole shooting of African Americans, uh, the perception now from what they see is that police kill unarmed citizens on video with impunity, without probable cause, and White, without black, fear of reprisal. White, black, it doesn't yeah. make any difference. It, we're not yeah. just talking about African Americans here. And, and the punishment is administrative leave with pay. I mean, yeah. it, it's, it's just wrong. There, it's, it's having, it goes back to the American culture of violence. Yeah. If you look at the, there's a fascinating personal freedom index, the 2014 Legatum Prosperity Index, which measures personal freedoms of American citizens versus the rest of the world. The U.S. has fallen from ninth in 2010 to 21st worldwide in 2014. On other scales, we rank as low as, as 46th. Wow. In Howard, personal freedoms. We got. We need to do a story on that alone. Okay, uh, Howard Nations, thank you for bringing this story to us. Police violence really is affects. You know, it's kind of like the old saying: they came for the they came for the unions first, and I wasn't yeah. concerned. And then they came for the socialists, and I wasn't concerned. And then they came for me. That's what we have to be concerned about as we think about this story. Thank you, Howard Nations. My pleasure, Mike. Thanks. That bottle of wine that you picked up on your last visit to the grocery store might be tainted with deadly arsenic. That's what new studies are showing. Recently, it was revealed that several California wineries had exceeded the allowable amounts of arsenic in their wines, which has spawned a massive lawsuit against those winemakers for their negligence. Joining me now to talk about that is Michael Berg. Michael, it looks like, uh, you know, you've always been involved in America's <laughs> biggest cases. But I got to tell you, as I look at this case that, uh, that we're talking about here, the wine industry, this is a big one, and it is a very important one. And I, I guess I ought to start off by saying good job, first of all, because well, it looks like nobody else had enough guts to go forward with this, even though they knew there was a problem. Lay this wine story out for us a little bit. Yeah, let me, let me first make sure everybody understands that we're not against the wine industry. As I said at the press conference, we love wine, we love drinking wine. The problem is, is that the cheap wines, there's 83 wines that have been tested in which the amount of arsenic is more than double the amount of arsenic allowed by the EPA uh, in, in drinking water. And in some cases, it's as high as uh, 600 times 
uh, 600% more than what's allowed in drinking okay, water. Okay, let, let me back up just a little bit. The EPA said, look, in order to keep people safe, and this wasn't just the EPA, it was many, many studies that came out of Correct. virtually every major science institute in, in this country. And the Inter International Health Organization right. also came out. NIOSH, same thing. NIOSH, that's right. right. So right. they came out and they said, in order to keep, America, uh, to, to keep people safe, we have to have standards. And we studied and we studied and we studied the standards. And the standards said that you cannot exceed a, a certain amount of arsenic in drinking water. Right. You, can't, ten, you can't. Right. Ten, ten parts per billion. Ten parts per ten. billion. They said if you do, the problem is it causes neurological disease, has potential to cause cancer, has potential to cause leukemia, and a whole host of different problems. I mean, they, there's a whole list. I, that's not right. exclusive. It's not all inclusive. Right. But arsenic causes bad results in human health. It's poison. Okay. It's, arsenic is poison. It's what they use to kill rats. It's rat poison. Arsenic is poison. Why is and, it in the cheap wines? Why is it there to begin well, with? Well, you know what? Let's, let's start with there's really, and again, we won't know until we actually see their testing, but the testing showed it's important, I think, to break down the arsenic from organic and inorganic arsenic. Okay, explain or that. Organic arsenic will come from the soil. And, and we've seen that in the apple juice cases. We've seen it in some of the rice cases. And the inorganic arsenic, while it's dangerous, is not as dangerous as the inorganic. The inorganic comes from pesticides. It comes from, it comes from a filler that's being put in. Um, we know on the cheap wines, that they, we believe that they don't do the filtration properly. And we actually, through our insider, the wine industry insider, Kevin Hicks, who actually brought, brought the case to us after he found out when he was just testing wines that these large amounts of, of arsenic were in the wines and these cheap wines, $10 and less, he went to the wine industry and they refused to talk to him. And they shut the door at him, he came to us. And then we tested, we took his tests, we retested them, and then we even went to a third testing uh, uh, company, and we broke down the inorganic and the organic, and most of the arsenic in these cheap wines is inorganic. Okay, what, is, what does that mean? What does that mean, first of all, and second of all, who, where do we find it the most? Okay, uh, what it means is that the inorganic is somewhere between, it's been, at least experts have said and studies have shown, 300 to 500 percent more dangerous than the organic arsenic and so and you find it the most in the cheap wines the fronds that we have a whole list of wines uh that contain it uh is there a um, website you have that people that is. are watching this can go to the website what is it it's tainedwine.com okay now, and now let me back up let me back up here just a second Somebody that, so, so it's been tested, independent labs have looked at this on two different occasions. Three, three actually three, 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 three independent labs. Three independent labs. Now, this is, um, this is something that's centering in California right now. In other words, you brought your case in California because they have statutes that allow you to go forward with these types of claims where they say, we want to protect the health of our citizenry. So where, where is this right now? Uh, how, is the, how is the wine is industry responding to this, Michael? What are they doing? What are they saying? Well, well, what they're saying is it's pretty interesting. I actually had a debate on NPR with one of the, uh, someone from the Wine Institute. What's interesting is at this point in time, they are not challenging our results, which I think is quite interesting. Uh, the, the, the results we show, which is, uh, you know, up to, uh, five times the amount allowed in drinking water. No one is saying your results are flawed. What they are saying is you can't compare wine to drinking water. And, and what they're saying is people drink more water than wine. Unfortunately, I know some people drink more wine than they drink water. Uh, so let's start there. And number two is what difference does it make? The question is, are you going to have large uh, concentrates and large percentage of arsenic in your wine, regardless, it's totally of it's, it's totally avoidable, Mike, isn't it? it I mean, it's it, totally it avoidable. Is. And let me tell you why. Um, Kevin Hicks did thir he tested thirteen hundred wines and came up with eighty three that were more than double the limit for drinking water. And we know that there are other companies. And I'll give you one for example. One of the largest winemakers in the world, Gallo, 
and they have they have wines that are that are ten dollars or less, they do not violate the drinking water standard. So we know that a winery can can if they want to if they want to worry about the public health, they can make sure that they don't have levels that are in excess of the 10 parts per billion. They can do it through better filtering. They can do it, we, we found out, uh, uh, Mike, that they, there's this grape goo that for some of the cheap wines, and we have, we have cartons of it, where they put that in and that has 10 times the amount. And this is, mainly, this is mainly from pesticides. It's a cumulative, uh, the, what we're talking about is a pesticide problem here because the leaf of the, of the grape is so large it, it bears uh, su such a burden of the pesticide, and that's where the grape gets its nutrition. Did I get it, that right? Well, it, it, that's partly right. That, it, it's coming from there, but it may be coming from other sources, which is you're buying this cheap grape goo, which we don't even know where it's made, where they've not filtered it at all. And then they also use some arsenic in some of the white wines for clarifying to actually make it look better. And so the combination of the pesticides the this this goo which is the unfiltered grape juice basically to make it look like wine and then the clarifying arsenic is what causes the levels to be so high and and every every expert on arsenic will tell you number one you don't want any arsenic in your wine if you can help it even though almost every wine has some arsenic in it because of the nature of the soils in which it's made but to have levels this high, it's a health risk. And what we asked was they take these, the, the wine, the box wines, the cheap wines, take them off the shelf. Yeah. In other words, the solution here, Mike, and we're out of time, but the solution is uh, just, it, this is not against the entire wine industry. It's the people who are cutting corners, creating a cheap wine, and people's health is at risk. Mike Berg, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Mike. Wisconsin Governor Walker recently signed right-to-work legislation in a state as part of his continued assault on labor unions. This is just the latest in the Republicans' attempt to destroy Wisconsin, and I recently spoke with Brendan Fisher from the Center for Media and Democracy about what's happening and could it affect the entire nation. Brendan, Scott Walker's traveling all over the country right now. He's giving speeches. He's appearing at conservative events. Uh, all these things we expect from somebody who's getting ready to test the waters for a presidential run. Uh, what is Walker out there saying now? What, what are the presidential statements that he's making that's going to uh, really appeal to the real fringe conservative right? Yeah, yeah. well, he's saying uh, pretty much the exact opposite of what he said last year when he was running for governor. Uh, when he uh, was up for a second term just before the 2014 election, he ran away from the right-to-work issue. He said that right-to-work is not going to, not going to come to his desk. Wisconsin is not going to be a right-to-work state. Uh, then a few months after he's reelected, he's signing right-to-work and boasting to CPAC and to Iowa, I Iowa conservatives that Wisconsin is now the 25th right-to-work state. Uh, he, and before the 2014 election, he had this ad where he looked right into the camera and told Wisconsin voters that he respects the woman's right to choose. Uh, a decision about an abortion should be, should be between a woman and her doctor. Uh, and now he is boasting of signing a uh, about his plans to sign a 20-week abortion ban, uh, and he's boasting about shutting down Planned Parenthood to, to Iowa voters. So, in other words, this is well, this is what we expect with Republicans, but not quite this obvious. Uh, that's what's so I guess so interesting. Let me break this down a little bit. Right to work. First of all, what 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 an awful thing to tell the the voters that they're actually voting for. It's anything but the right to work. If anything, what it does is it, it deconstructs the possibilities of the right to work. Explain that. Yeah, I think that that's uh, that, that's absolutely right. I mean, it's right to work is basically. I mean, it's been described as the the right to work for less. It has the effect of driving down wages uh, for both union and non-union workers, and it really means the right to freeload because if a uh, if a majority of workers within a particular particular shop uh, vote to unionize, then the union is going to act as the exclusive bargaining uh, representative of all of those workers, and they're going to work. They're going to bargain for higher wages and more benefits. And uh, what right to work does is allow 
non-union members to free ride on the uh, on the uh, on that on that negotiation and to get all of the benefits of union representation without paying the cost. So it's really right to, uh, it could be described as right to free ride, um, but it, it has the ultimate effect of defunding unions, making it harder to, uh, uh, to organize and to collectively bargain, and that increases the influence of corporations both in the, the workplace and in the political sphere. Okay, but the point is you've got Scott Bra- Scott Walker out bragging about that that's what he did to, uh, to right, right in his backyard, this is what he did to Wisconsin. Uh, and so so now, uh, now he's saying that this is good for the country. Yeah, apparently. I mean, it's really, it, it's hard to make the argument that it's good for it's good for the country. And during the right to work debate in Wisconsin, you saw the you saw the justifications for right to work sort of sort of shifting, uh, or or depending on who you talk to. Some people, some of the proponents would frame it in terms of of worker freedom that it's a uh, or it's a worker's right to choose whether they want to free ride or not. Uh, others have claimed that it makes it uh, make the state more appealing for. Uh, for for businesses and none of these claims have really have ever really stood up. Well, but but what's important, it seems to me, Brendan, is this is Scott Walker believes that this has a national voice that throughout the nation we want to do away with unions. Is if you listen to what he, I mean, if if you buy into what he's saying, that this has a national platform that we want to do completely away with uh, with with unions because this would. And that's the first thing he's out there bragging about. And the second thing is that we want to do away with uh, the right uh, for women to make a choice, because that's now his next move. So, I mean, if you look at how far to the right that swing is, he believes he's going to win in the primaries with a very, very strong right-wing message. Oh, I think that's, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, he, he staked out the position of running to the right of Right up Jeb Bush uh, and trying to rope in a few major few major donors along the way, um, but I think it's it's entirely fair to to infer that he is going to support a national national right to work. If Walker were to become uh, were to become president, he would support national uh, a national right to work uh, bill, and he would and he would push for as many abortion restrictions as that as he could get through and appoint uh, justices and uh, and federal judges. That would uh, take a uh, take a very limited view of, uh, of of what forms of abortion so, are. So, so he'd use executive orders. He'd use the courts to accomplish at least those two things. But let's go through the list of what he's doing to the state of Wisconsin. I mean, look look at his money management. I mean, right now uh, the the budget proposal that he came up with is now, it now has Wisconsin in uh, over a billion dollar deficit. I mean, isn't that what he needs to raise another billion dollars because he cut taxes. Isn't that kind of what we'll expect with him again? Cut taxes, to the big corporations, uh, and, and then hope that you have enough money to pay for things like uh, schools and military and such as that. Isn't that kind of the way he's approaching this? Yeah. I mean, I think Walker has consistently, uh, uh, been focused on campaigning and campaigning for his his next office. I mean, throughout his entire entire political career, which and he has been a politician for most of his most of his adult life, uh, he, he's always set his sights on on the next office and has really not focused all that much on on governing. And the policies that he's been he's been pushing through have been primarily since he's become governor. The policies that Walker has been pushing through and focused on. Uh, has been focused on a, a national audience and focused on appeasing major donors. Uh, you know, when he pushed Act 10, the, the the legislation that was aimed at public sector unions, it was promised that this was going to uh, you know, help uh, help shore up the deficit, and uh, it's going to create job growth in Wisconsin. And the corporate tax cuts that he pushed through were going to uh, promote economic development, and Wisconsin was going to create 250,000 jobs. In his first term, and now he's a billion dollars short. Doesn't know where he's going to get the money. There's, there's massive deficits in Wisconsin, or there's very large deficits in Wisconsin, almost as large as when he when he first took office. And Wisconsin lags the rest of the nation when it comes to job growth, and is uh, is last in the Midwest when it comes to uh, when it comes to job growth and economic recovery. Okay. Uh, all of the promises, all of the legislation that he's pushed through, that's extreme legislation uh, that's that's prompted massive protests. He promised that. 
these harsh cuts to schools, these harsh attacks on public sector workers and now private sector workers were justified because it was needed for job growth and balancing and, and, and budget. budget. And, and that, it, of those things have come through. Yeah, come and through. as a matter of fact, the budget's in worse condition, and the chances of him balancing any budget is impossible. But nevertheless, he's cut. He's cut schools to the quick. I mean, he wants to cut three hundred million dollars away from Wisconsin's, you know, major university. He's cut schools. Uh, so, so the, again, my question is: Does that play well on a national platform? Is, is is in other words, is he in is he in sync with the American public? And maybe just you and I are looking at saying, how would you possibly go in saying that you're going to talk about taking away union rights totally? that you're going to take away women's right to choose, that you're going to cut education, that you're going to pass on major tax cuts to corporations, and then create a budget that you can't even balance the budget and end up with a deficit. I mean, that's, that's, the, short, that's the short sentence about Scott Walker's history, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I certainly don't think he's in sync with, uh, with the majority of American voters, and he's not even sync in, in sync with the majority of, of Wisconsin voters. I mean, the fact that he, during the 2014 campaign, he had to run away from, from right to work, he had to run away from abortion restrictions, uh, is indicative of, 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 of where, where voters really stood. And since he's begun to push through this, uh, this legislation, like right to work and like these plans for restricting abortions, his, his poll numbers have really dropped in Wisconsin. Isn't all of this that he's doing almost like he's being ordered to do this by way, of course, his big, his big benefactors, which are the Koch brothers and all, a whole host of other billionaires? But this is really coming from the Alec playbook, isn't it? I mean, how does this? How do you get any closer to Alec's wishes for a governor? Yeah, yeah. Well, and and uh, Walker is an Alec alumni uh, alumnus. He uh, he was a member of Alec when he was in the legislature. Uh, uh, Alec just tweeted a picture a few weeks ago of, uh, of Walker arm in arm with, uh, with Alec CEO and boasting of their, of their alumni governor. And, uh, yeah, and I think most of the legislation that he's pushed through, or at least most of the, the controversial legislation he's pushed through has come directly from the Alec playbook. Uh, the attacks on unions, that's an Alec bill. We, uh, we did a side by side between Wisconsin right to work bill and the Alec model right to work act. And it's a basically it's basically a word for word copy. Well, two uh, a couple of years ago, of course, they caught it was the actual bill that Alec had written in, in word for word. I mean, and 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 Scott Walker pushed that through. Uh, so so is is this Alec allegiance that he has? Isn't this his way to kind of confront uh, to confront Jeb Bush in the money hunt? Isn't this all really about the money hunt? Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's clearly a, uh, a a competition right now uh, among major Republican candidates for for donors. Uh, they not only have to appeal to uh, the right wing right wing Iowa Iowa caucus goers and New Hampshire New Hampshire New Hampshire primary voters, but there's the the race is on for uh, for major right wing funders. Uh, and you know, I think Walker has demonstrated that he is willing to do what. Funders want. Um, he, he's not someone who seems to stand on stand on principle, or to have his have strong policy positions that he personally supports or has developed throughout throughout the the course of his lifetime, or that he's he's developed from his personal experiences. Um, he, he's more than willing to do uh, whatever is necessary to uh, to win elections and to and, and to attract uh, and, and to attract big funders. Uh, so well, and, and you let me ask you this: there, there's some uh, the, the discussion now is becoming: has the American public been so dumbed down? I mean, have they become just so 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 ignorant that it's okay for a candidate like Walker to say, "I don't understand evolution, therefore I don't want to talk about it," or "I don't understand climate change, there I, therefore I don't want to talk about it," and yes, I dropped out of college because I couldn't make it. Is that just okay with the American public right now? I mean, do you think we've really been dumbed down that far? Yeah, I don't. You know, I, I certainly don't think so. And I think with Walker, what's really interesting is we, as we started this uh, this show, we were talking about this this is the way he governs by sneak attack and doesn't tell uh, the public what he what he's going to do uh, or what policies he's going to push when he's actually elected. Uh, so so these so these types of questions are. Uh, 
become even more important. I mean, the, we, we need these probing questions to know where, uh, where an elected official is coming from and what motivates them. Uh, so I think when, when you have a politician like Walker who, who governs by sneak attack, uh, it becomes even more important to to have uh, to have significant details about where they're where they stand on a lot of issues uh, to at least have have some to try and infer what they're going to do when they're actually in office. So so right now, um, you know, Walker is widely considered a front runner, as you as I'm sure you know, um, and as a front runner within that uh, within that primary kind of group of it's almost a clown car when you really start putting them side by side it's it's really a repeat of the last time i mean i don't know how else to put it it's it's a repeat of the last time it's a little bit laughable a little bit scary but from a democrat standpoint it seems to be very beneficial to have the weakest guy prevail and in 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 the primary race because of the way the republican party has has evolved uh, devolved i guess is the better way to put it a guy like Walker wins, but does that really mean anything on a national uh, on a national scale? You see, isn't isn't that really the problem? Sarah Palin could win, but in the primaries, but could she win on a national scale? I mean, shouldn't this be good news for the Democrats? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think um, one of the one of the things about the way Walker has won elections in Wisconsin has. Uh, uh, has been that they've always been in very low turnout, low turnout races. He's never won an election uh, uh, during a presidential year, during a presidential election. Uh, 2010 it was an off-year election, low turnout. Uh, 2012 it was a uh, it, that that election was in June, and 2014 another another off-year election. And these are good these are good uh, good good elections for Republicans. And throughout those three different election cycles. He's never expanded his, his base of support uh, among, among Wisconsin voters. So he's, you know, he's, he's really not been tested on, uh, on the type of elections that, on, the, on presidential elections, when there's higher turnout uh, and you really have to appeal to a broader, a broader set, of, uh, set of the populace. I suppose what I'm saying is if you are even moderate to progressive and you want a real president that has some possibilities of actually making a big impact in this country, aren't you kind of pulling for Walker to make it through the primaries in hopes that the Democrats can put up somebody hopefully better than Hillary Clinton to, to uh, be engaged in a, national, in a national fight? I mean, if I'm a... I'm not Democrat, but if if I were Democrat, I'd be saying, "Yeah, go Walker, go!" In the primaries, it, yeah. isn't it almost that ridiculous? Yeah, I mean, I think the the I think it has been easy to underestimate Walker, though, um, because I think as we've seen in the 2010, 2012, and 2014 elections, he he will say whatever it takes to get elected. Um, you don't necessarily know what he's going to do once he's in office, but. He uh, he can he's very good at messaging. Uh, he's pretty cool under pressure. Uh, doesn't easily get rattled, and will say what it takes to get to get into office. Um, you know, and he's a Midwesterner, and I'm a Midwesterner. Uh, he's he's got kind of an aloof aloof personality, and I think it is easy to underestimate estimate him. Um, in some ways, like you said, he hasn't been tested in these high turnout presidential election years. Um, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't underestimate Walker. Or as 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 George Bush would say, don't misunderestimate him, huh? <laughs> so uh, the one thing for certain is that he's going to have he's going to have more money than most of the candidates. Don't you agree? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think one of the things that the that the recall election really uh, really did for him is to help develop a national national base of donors. I mean, the Cokes, uh, uh, the Cokes, of course, but also the the fundraising that he was able to do. Uh, in 2012, when he could accept unlimited contributions, and the and the fundraising that he did for Wisconsin Club for Growth, the dark money group that mm. he allegedly was was coordinating with during 2012, uh, he got major donations from uh, from Donald Trump, for example. He got he got <laughs> donations from uh, SAC Capital Advisors. Yeah. He got a million dollar donation from from those guys. He's he's developed a a, a good rolodex of of potential funders. Yeah. Yeah, I think he, I think he's going to come in with the money, Brendan. I, and and I, again, I to me, I'd be joyful if I were a Democrat. Well, look, thanks for joining us. Uh, let's keep up with this story. We'll have you back on as this develops, and we'll kind of have maybe a few laughs as as he gets up there on stage and says what I know he's going to say. So, anyway, yeah, yeah. That, if he can if he can take on if he can take on the protesters, he can take on ISIS. Yeah. 
Thanks for joining me, okay? <laughs> so, Pap, of course, uh, still in the news, the mainstream media cannot get enough of an opportunity to attempt to ding the Clintons, even though, uh, to a large extent, you see the New York Times walking back their initial story that uh, Hillary Clinton had somehow broken the law in terms of the way that she treated her emails as Secretary of State. But what has really come out of this is that your former governor, Jeb Bush, uh, he's got his own email problem, perhaps a bigger one. Well, you know, let me let me preface this uh, with this story, uh, what we're talking about here. It's interesting the way the Jeb Bush story evolved. It evolved with people. It really evolved with social media. And, and that's such an interesting thing. Of course, it jumped into into national media. It's, it still is picking up legs. But I, I saw that you are doing a money raise for majority report, Sam. And what people listening to this program really need to understand is this social media is the last vestige of being able to resurrect and create uh, uh, the narratives that tell the truth on, on so many stories, like the Jeb Bush story. Um, I, I'm hoping people support you on that because it's so critically important. It really is. Yeah, I appreciate that, Pat. People can go to the majority report dot com and and contribute. But, you know, you're right about this. And what has been fascinating to me is uh, you and I both remember what the 90s were like with uh, the Clinton administration. Now, uh, I don't know about you. I got some real policy differences with the Clintons uh, or at the very least uh, with Bill Clinton. And I assume uh, from what I can tell, I'll have some with Hillary Clinton as well. well let but me, but th- let me compare notes here. Let, let's compare notes. Let's talk about the Jeb Bush story. Right. The, the Jeb Bush email dump, first of all, I think it reveals a lot about what we've already suspected ab- about Jeb Bush as a potential 2016 presidential candidate. It really showed us, this email dump story, that he is, uh, he is identical to his brother. There is no difference. As a matter of fact, he may even be a little more of a war hawk than his brother. I, what, I, I what think we're, that's the case. Yeah, I think what we're seeing in these emails, we're seeing it's not just... It's not just political favors that are overwhelming. It is like, you sent me money, what can I do for you? And then everything they ask for, he delivers. But it's also that war hawk mentality that is like crazy when you read this. Disregard for the rules, that sounds just like the Mm -hmm. little shrub. I mean, these are the traits that Jeb Bush was hoping to keep hidden from the public before his 2016 campaign. But really what's happening is we're finding all of these trends, all these email, uh, uh, all all these personality dysfunctions in these thousands of emails that uh, he he received and he sent as governor, strings of notes from campaign donors asking for favors, uh, telling virtually, not suggesting, but telling him what he needed to do. Sometimes he'd appoint a a person, a donor who had been recommended for a position. I mean, constantly we did did that. Other times he even rejected the advice of his own advisors on things like legislation because somebody ordered him to do a certain thing. Uh, we see this relationship with uh, this citrus ty- tycoon, Bill Becker. I mean, ordered <laughs> ordered Bush around, ordered the little little Jeb around like he was a, a child clown. Yeah. This was a guy that raised a lot of money for him, flew him around in his jet, Another financial backer, uh, uh, Mark uh, Gusetta, you know, this is this Bo- Boca Raton real estate developer uh, who was co-chairman of Bush's uh, finance committee uh, when he was running for governor. He was, uh, Bush was his, his best man in the, in the wedding when he got married, but he brokered a $46 million sale of a vacant IBM park in Boca Raton to Gazetta. And when you look at how it's done, it is really very suspect. Those stories are all going to now resurface. And I think I think that's really good. I mean, the, the, it's, it shows the picture of him giving away judgeships to the highest bidder, insurance commissioners to the highest bidder, Florida Transportation Commission to the, you know, just name it. And if the money sign was there, that's who won. If the biggest right. money sign was there, that's who won. 
And, you know, this is a good opportunity for us to remind people that when the Project for New American Century, which was a group of neocons, probably like the original neocon institution. That it when got they, us involved in, our, in, in Iraq, caused well, the invasion when, of Iraq. But go ahead. They, when they were coming out, and we're talking guys like uh, Dick Cheney, uh, Wolfowitz, Pearl, uh, and what Rumsfeld, people forget, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what people forget is that one of the original signers of the Project for New American Century document, the first document they ever put out, which basically talked about how uh, the United States was going to be a hyperpower in this world without a Soviet Union. We, the, our job was to basically be the uber power and allow for a lot of low-level conflicts that would happen throughout the world so that we would have no one to a challenge our uh, hyperpowerness, if you will. And one of the keys to the Project for New American Century's vision was for us to control the spigot of oil in the Middle East. And that called for an invasion of Iraq. And Jeb Bush was one of those original signers on the Project for a New American Century. Now, I think in the later documents, he decided to stop signing them because he realized, like, hey, wait a second, I'm getting a little too close to the presidency here, and my political future may uh, may may be problematic for me to, to sign on to a document But like you know this. what, Sam, the ones he signed, the documents he signed, were just very clear. A, Indeed. that he is an absolute pathetic war hawk. B, he's a war hawk because corporate America wants him to be a war hawk, not because he's worried about national safety. You know, it's, that's not the issue or international stability. It was because the oil companies want to be there. Corporate America wants to be there. If you look, look, it's, it's interesting. You look through uh, the, the other part of these emails. If you take a look at the Jeb Bush dump of these emails, he, he, you know, his, his great talking point in the past has been he's his own man. OK, look at these emails. He is like a he, he is like a pathetic puppet, cookie cutter, corporate Republican candidate can't make a decision without his corporate funders saying it's OK. That's what these emails show. Then you look at the military side of things where Bush would give his thoughts on, you know, how we're going to move to troops, why we should move troops here, how we when we, we should move them, how many we should send. Almost like he's a military strategist giving right. military strategy advice on an unsecured email server that could have been easily hacked by, you know, to destroy military operations. But, you know, hey, Sam, there's another part to this. Wait till Boehner is in a position of saying, okay, let's open up the investigations of Hillary Clinton where it comes to what she did with her email uh, account. Wait till, right. wait till you hear the Republicans and Boehner open that and ignore what is going on, what's gone on with uh, uh, Jeb yeah, Bush. But, First of all, the, it's pretty clear. If, if Boehner announces a House investigation into Clinton's emails and, and, uh, and hers alone, it, this, this isn't a general investigation. It's political. Now, if he adds Jeb Bush to it, it's a general investigation. But otherwise, it's a political investigation. And the House rules, the laws, the criminal laws say that House resources – can't be used for re-election or election purposes. Oh, well, of course. And that's why we know that this is all coming out of that uh, special select Benghazi committee, because they've got nothing else to go for. And, and to a large extent, it really shows that the whole Benghazi thing for a long time has been just an excuse for a fishing expedition. I mean, look, we remember that how uh, this went down with uh, Bill Clinton, right? It starts with a, a supposed real estate deal in Arkansas that is investigated. They appoint a special uh, prosecutor, an independent counsel, so that uh, this can go away. And they find nothing in terms of Whitewater. But Ken Starr, the guy who's perfectly willing to uh, negotiate on behalf of a pedophile, uh, a guy mm -hmm. who's you know down in Florida, mm -hmm. uh, uh, starts digging around and... Um, uh, this ultimately leads to putting a wire on a woman to go talk to another woman about an affair that she's having with Bill Clinton. I mean, this is what this is what they want. They want to have this sort of like unfettered power dummy. It, to it, try it, and drum up some right. type of controversies. And again, it's, you know, this it, is this is 
you and I both agree uh, we would love to see a different candidate than Hillary Clinton be the Democratic uh, standard bearer. But that doesn't mean that we have to sign off on an endless series of investigations creating fake scandals. Well, that's true. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I, she, she, first of all, she really hasn't done anything wrong. But it's nauseating to me that, uh, as I said before, that, Republic, that Democrats have started acting like Republicans in the sense that they don't even yep. question, did she do anything wrong? Instead, you see the Democrats angry because Clinton didn't tell them what to say soon enough after the scandal broke. It's just, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to, to analyze the, uh, Democrats in terms of that kind of thinking. That is so Republican. Look, yeah, interesting thing, talking about Benghazi. Next time somebody wants to ask, talk about Benghazi at a water cooler, ask them to explain Benghazi to you. And you know what? I promise you, this is my promise to you, nine times out of ten, they will not even know what Benghazi is about. Beyond the word Benghazi, they won't even know what the intricacies of it all is about. I mean, it's amazing. I've done it. It's fun. Ask them, well, can, what, now you're talking about Benghazi. That sounds bad. How about explain the details to me? And it's, it's, it's hilarious. Watch them do that. Watch them burn down. I agree. It is. Uh, there's nothing more fun than asking someone to explain what the scandal is there with Benghazi. That's it for this week's Ring of Fire, but you can keep up with us throughout the week online at ringoffireradio.com or at Twitter at Ring of Fire Radio and on Facebook. I'm Mike Papantonio, and we'll see you next week right here on Ring of Fire.